we live in a conditioned world, which means that we have to learn how to live with limitations. Some conditions open up possibilities, other conditions close them off. And our range of limitations fluctuates all the time. It's as if we're living on an ocean with the, rate, the waves rising and falling. Sometimes they're small waves, sometimes they're big waves, sometimes they're huge waves that overcome us. Sometimes the currents push us in the direction we want to go, other times the currents are going in the wrong direction, we have to fight them. Sometimes we can win the fight, sometimes we can't. This is why people go crazy. Because everything is so uncertain. They've done experiments with pigeons, put them in boxes, and you put them in a box with a green button and a red button. And in the boxes where if the pigeon presses the green button, it gets food. If it presses the red button, it doesn't get anything. Those pigeons are very well adjusted. If it's in a box where sometimes you push the green button and you get food and sometimes you don't, Sometimes you push the red button, you get food, and sometimes you don't. Those pigeons go crazy. So what we have to learn how to do is learn how not to go crazy with all these fluctuations. Look for patterns in your life, because they are there. They're complex, but they're there. And learn how to test your limitations. And so if you give up entirely, you live a totally passive life and you just become a victim of events. In other words, you say, well, my mind is the way it is. There's no way I'm going to change it. Greed, anger, and delusion are natural. You just have to give in to them. That's totally giving in. Your raft on the ocean gets tossed wherever the currents and the waves may go. If you simply believe, however, that Okay, you have an unlimited power to go whichever direction you want to go. You end up living in a total fantasy world. And then the clash of your fantasy world and the actual world, that can wipe you out as well. So we have to learn how to read the currents, learn how to anticipate the waves. And this requires being really observant. This is one of the reasons why we meditate, is to develop our powers of observation. So we can gain a sense of where our other powers lie, what we can accomplish. And when you run up against a wall, recognize that you've run up against a wall. And focus your energies in other directions, where they will bear fruit. Our whole sense of who we are comes from the fact that as children we learned how to test the limitations that were on us, what things could we control, what things were beyond our control. This is why we started to identify with the body. Not only was it where we were experiencing pleasure and pain, but also it seemed to be at least some extent under our control. We learned how to move our fingers, learned how to grasp things, learned how to stand up and walk. We kept pushing the limits, and for a while it seemed like the limits were getting further and further away. We had more and more under control. Then, of course, as you get older, the turns around in the other direction. In some cases, you can develop a skill that you can keep working at throughout your life, but you begin to find, well, the body gets old, it begins to get creaky here and painful there. And finally gets to the point you can't control it anymore. So you have to learn how to make the most of it, why you've got the, the control you've got. What it comes down to is that we learn that there are certain things we have power over and we turn to identify with those. They're us or they're ours. And we do it in many different ways. Our sense of who we are is something we keep creating for each different situation. And it's good to learn how to be fluid in that skill of identifying yourself. If you come into a situation with certain preconceived notions about who you are or what you are, 
that becomes a major limitation. Would you turn yourself into a being? And as the Buddha said, when you become a being, you identify with this form, feeling, perception, fabrications, consciousness of particular kinds. And whatever you identify with yourself with, the Buddha says you limit yourself that way. And there are certain powers that you have by bringing those things under your control, but also that certain limitations that get placed on you, which for particular tasks may not be a getting in the way of what you want. But if you take one particular idea of who you are and try to apply it everywhere, you begin to run into the limitations. And then you've got that one big limitation, as the Buddha once said, what is one all beings subsist on food? Once you become a being, you've got to feed those things that you identify with. That means you're tied to your source of food, you're tied to this process of feeding. And there's no way that you're not going to be harming somebody feeding either physically off of them, feeding emotionally off of them. So that's a limitation right there. We like to think that we can be beings of infinite love, compassion, empathetic joy. But if part of you is feeding, okay, that places a limitation on how totally harmless you can be. So the ideal is to learn how to develop different ways of identifying your powers and using them so ultimately you get to the point where you don't have to be a being anymore. You don't have to identify yourself with anything. And you don't have to feed. Uh, you, and you just can't will yourself to, into that position. You get there through learning to be skillful. But once you get there, you're totally free from limitation. That's the one standard in all the the Buddhist discussion, discussions of nirvana, the most positive statement he makes about it. Many times he talks about it in terms of analogies and similes. But total freedom, total limitlessness, that's the most direct description he has for the goal. But to get there, you've got to explore your powers, what you can do within the realm of conditioned reality. And there's a story that's useful to reflect on. It's a little fable that's in the novel, The Once and Future King by T. H. White. I don't know if you know the novel. It's his retelling of the Arthur legend. And in the first book, The Sword and the Stone, I think Walt Disney made a movie of it. And right, young Arthur, it's his childhood, up to the point where he pulls the sword out of the stone. It's going to be made Arthur, King of England. But as part of his training leading up to that, Merlin, the magician, turns young Wart into different kinds of animals. And he learns lessons from the animals. And in this particular one, he's been turned into a badger. And he goes down and he meets a badger in his hole. And it turns out this badger has written a PhD thesis on why human beings are better off than animals. And in his, his styling of the, the creation myth. That on, I think it was day number five, after God had created all the animals, he hadn't created them in their final form. He created them as embryos. And he lined up all the little embryos and said, OK, you're going to get to choose your tools. You can equip your bodies with different tools. You can equip them with scissors. You can equip them with hoes to dig, scissors to cut. Any kind of tool you want that you think is going to be useful living. In the world. And so the animals thought about their tools, and the badgers turned their, their forearms into, into digger, digging tools, and so on down the line. Some of them wanted wings, some of them wanted tails to use as their tools. And so all the all little embryos had chosen their tools. And equip their bodies permanently with these tools. Let's just all that left was the little man. And so God said, Okay, man, what do you want? And the Limbrio said, I've been thinking about this, and I think I would rather use tools than be a tool. Learn how to make them, learn how to have all kinds of different tools. Rather than just limiting myself to one or two. 
And so, ah, God said, okay, you've guessed our riddle here. So because you learn how to use tools, you get to have dominion over the other animals. So that's the, the badger's creation myth. And it has a good point. If you identify yourself with a particular tool all the time, you get limited to that tool. And the myth, he talks about how one of the toads in the Antipodes decided to trade its whole body for blotting paper. Now you could soak up water when there was water and then just hold it throughout the dry season. Well, that's all it can do. It can live in a place where there's infrequent rain, but that's pretty much the limit of its abilities. Whereas human beings can make tools and use different tools for different situations. And that's a lesson we have to learn as meditators. That who you are is a tool. It's something you've made for a particular set of circumstances. But if you hold on to that tool all the time, it's like turning yourself into a hammer and then wanting to just hammer away at everything, you thinking, hoping that the hammer will solve all your problems, even though there are times when you need a, a saw or a chisel or a wrench. So after being a hammer for a while, you may decide, well, I don't want to be anything at all. So you throw away your hammer. Well, that doesn't work either, because there are times when you will need a hammer. So the trick is how to learn to come to a particular situation, not with a preconceived notion of who you are or who you want to be, and then trying to squeeze that into the situation or squeeze the situation to fit your idea of who you are. You've got to learn how to look at the situation for what it is and look at what's the skillful action, what's the skillful choice to be done right now, and then look at what powers you have and turn those into the tool you're going to need for that particular situation. Even your sense of self can be a tool, and you have many different sense of selves. And if you learn how to pick them up and put them down, and have them at hand when you need them, then you have a whole tool chest. In this way, you find yourself dealing a lot more effectively with the limitations we have as human beings. The Buddha talks about three basic ways of finding happiness. There's generosity. There's virtue and there's meditation. And they have their different limitations. Generosity is sometimes limited by how much time you have, how much energy you have, how many material resources you have. And that's something you have to learn to be very judicious in how you apply your resources. You can't just pour all your resources into one, one basket. Because then you find you're totally run out and you need them for other things as well. So even though we're taught that we should have limitless goodwill, limitless compassion, limitless empathetic joy, there's only so much we can actually give to a situation. So here you are meeting up with a dissonance between the attitude you can develop and your ability to act on that attitude. This is where equanimity comes in. When you realize that there are certain things where you just simply can't make a difference, or things that you can make a difference, but they're going to require time. So you have to learn how to husband your resources so you can devote yourself to that task throughout whatever amount of time it's going to require. Then there's virtue. The virtue has its limitations. As I said, once you're a being, you have to feed. So it's impossible for us to be totally harmless. But we can focus on ways that are really important of learning how to develop harmlessness. This is what the precepts are for. And as the Buddha said, when you make your precept limitless, in other words, you decide that you're not going to kill under any circumstances, you're not going to steal under any circumstances, anybody at all from anyone at all. No illicit sex, no lying, no intoxicants, period. That is a universal gift. As the Buddha said, you give limitless protection to all beings, and you're going to have a share in that limitless protection as well. 
So that's one area where you can push the limits. And push them way out. You can start embracing the concept of all living beings. You're not going to harm any of them in any of these five ways. And then there's meditation, which as one of the forms of making merit, the Buddha starts out with meditation on goodwill. And here again you have limitlessness. You're supposed to develop limitless goodwill for all beings. The limitlessness here means that it's for all beings in all situations, no matter what they do. It's never a question of do they deserve your goodwill? Or do you if you deserve goodwill? It's simply a question that it's good for all beings to find true happiness. So you want them to find true happiness. You make that one of your basic motivations. But then, of course, you run into situations where you can't make everybody happy. After all, the quest for true happiness is something that each person has to do for him or herself. It's a question of skill. You can't just push a skill on somebody. They have to see the need to develop the skill. They have to be willing to put in the time and the energy to do that. And they also have to be in a position where they can. Sometimes people are too old, too sick to make much progress in that direction. This is why equanimity is there. That has to be limitless as well. In other words, you have to be able to call on it whenever you can, whenever it's needed, when you realize that certain situations are beyond your control. In terms of the generosity that you want to give, in terms of your time, energy. There are going to be limitations. There are limitations on what you can accomplish, given other people's karma as well. So you have to be able to call on those, this attitude of limitless equanimity. When you develop these attitudes, it's important that you realize that you've got certain atti other attitudes you've got to learn how to fight, the limiting attitudes. Ill will is the main problem with the first three of the Brahma-viharas, ill will, resentment, cruelty. The limitation on equanimity is affection. The people you really love that you would like to give all you can to, but you can't help them as much as you want. That's why you have to realize that even that affection is a limitation, and you have to learn how to put that aside. It's not that you don't like them or don't wish them well, but the affection that wants you to be able to overcome the limits of karma. That's got you, again, beating your head against a wall, when you could be going through a door that's in the wall, not too far away. In other words, helping them in areas where you can help them. So a lot of our practice is learning how to deal with limitations, how to find where your powers are, how far you can push them. And then when you meet up with a limitation, learn to recognize, is this a permanent limitation or simply a temporary one? And then bring whatever tools you can find to bear on developing your powers in a, as compassionate and wise a way as you can, admitting limitations where they are and working around them when you can, and developing a full set of tools. We all have this tendency to throw away our tools. You learn a trick in your meditation, you learn an approach in your meditation, it works for a little while, and then it doesn't work. And so what do you do? You throw it away. Try something else. And it, it may simply be that your tactic works for certain things, but not for other things. So it's good not to throw these things away. Keep them in mind as possible approaches that may come in useful again. Or the whole idea of yourself, saying, I should not have any self at all. Well, if you can't identify where your powers are, what are you going to work with? What are you going to depend on? What will you use to overcome your limitations? As I said earlier, think of your sense of self as a tool. And again, you want to have different tools for different situations. Instead of bringing a preconceived notion of self into a situation, as I said, Look at the situation. What is the skillful thing to be done here? What tools do you have to 
to apply to that situation, to do that skillful thing. Put them to use. That way you become the little human being in the myth. Use whatever tools you have and then you're in charge. The more tools you can develop, the better. Because they help you explore where the limitations are and where the openings are in the limitations that open ultimately to an area that is totally free from limitation, totally unconditioned. At that point you can put all your tools down, as long as you're alive you can still use them, but when the time comes to go you don't need to carry them, like the raft it takes you across the river. Once it's done its job, you just leave it there. You might pull it up on the bank in case anyone else wants to come along and find it and use it. But otherwise, you're done with the raft. In the meantime, though, as long as you're crossing the river, hold on tight to the raft, whichever raft is going to get you past the